me out to the... Me and Grandpa, we peanut, cracker, cracker. I don't care. Come back, it's in the home, same day, and she is a one, two, three, you okay. You know what? What? I wish you were a Cub fan. All children require physical activity and social interaction to function happily and well. Yet one in every eight American school children is restricted by learning or emotional disabilities, by vision, hearing, or speech problems, or by an inability to use their limbs normally. These children face the same developmental tasks as other children, but the difficulty and the timing of these tasks may be different. In this program, we'll come to know two young people meeting the challenges of growth in their own way and in their own good time. We'll meet a specialist in physical rehabilitation who understands the needs of children with disabilities. For these children and for their families, everything from just tossing a ball to the developmental tasks of life will be more difficult for everyone involved for the rest of their lives. <laughs> Sean Miller has cerebral palsy. He's shy, but if you give him a chance, he warms right up and shows you something special, like a picture book of his favorite basketball players. Who's that? Mac Johnson. Yeah, that's Magic Johnson. Look at these funny guys. Look what he's doing. What's he doing? What's him doing? He's, I know what he's doing. Look at he's shaving his head. Right. Kareem. Kareem. Oh, you know Kareem? Well, I've, I saw him on television. He's big. He's good. I know. I know Larry Bird. You know Larry Bird? Yeah. Where did you? Who gave you this book? Let's get me mom did. Sean's mom, Wanda, made the basketball picture book for him just a few months ago. But early on, it was hard for her to give of herself to her child. It was hard because Wanda's husband left home a few weeks after Sean was born. He never returned. Now a divorced single parent, Wanda works a 10-hour night shift arranged around Sean's schedule. Actually, I almost hated my son when he was born. You know, it's... <sighs> It's, it's really hard to explain, you know, because you're just, you're so mixed up because you're supposed to love this child, you just have this child and this is your child, but it's not normal and you can't send it back. Born with a heart defect, Sean underwent three operations in his first week of life. During the third open heart surgery, his heart stopped. He lived, but he would never be a normal child. It was two months before Wanda could take Sean home from the hospital. Caring for any newborn is a full-time job, but for the parents of disabled children, everything is harder. The first year was real hard, totally hard. Um, he would come home from the hospital. And he needed a lot of work. Uh, you, you had to put, give him medicine every, um, or every so many hours, and he had to be fed every three hours, and he had to put a tube in through his nose and down his stomach, and he became a nurse. You know, he just things you had to do when you'd wake up and you think, oh, I've had enough. For Wanda, the turning point came when Sean started to respond to her. But then after a while, when that child finally, and it took him a long time before he could talk, and finally realizes that, you know, he says, Mom, or he hugs you. And then it's all worth it, you know. But before that, it takes a long time before, like a normal child or a regular child would, you know, they're reaching for mom and laughing and stuff. Well, it's like you're taking care of this, this person and they're not giving you anything back, you know, and finally they do. And then all of a sudden, well, wait a minute, you know, maybe it wasn't so bad after all. Do you have any pets at home? Mm, yeah. You do? What you got? I don't know. Do you have a crocodile? Cat. Oh, you have a cat? Yeah. What's your cat's name? 
Muffin. Muffin? What, yeah. do, what does muffin do? Eat. I bet you I know what muffin eats. What? Dog food. No. No? Fish food? No. Cat food? Yeah. Cat food. Well, muffin's pretty smart, then. She eats cat food. Heather had muffin. Heather is Sean's nine-year-old sister. She accepted and loved him from the very beginning. He's one of my best friends I've ever had in my life. Your brother? Yes. Well, what do you like to do with your brother? Play ball. <sighs> Let him watch me and my friends play baseball sometimes. Wrestle, stuff like that. Can you yeah. beat him up? I could if I wanted to, but I don't want to. <laughs> I love him. Heather is Sean's self-appointed bodyguard. Do other, have other kids been mean to Sean sometimes? Yeah, and then I just get in fights with him. That's why I got into fight with Melissa. She started talking about Sean, and I couldn't handle it no more. <laughs> ah, so what are, the, what are the mean things that the kids do? To say he's handicapped and start laughing and stuff. Mm -hmm. If we're at school, I can't put a hand on kids because I'll go down to the office and I don't want to... Um, go down to the office, so I'll just tell the teacher. She'll put them on the wall for a while. Are you telling me that nobody messes with your brother? Yeah. And what happens if they mess with your brother? <laughs> they get their butt kicked. And who will take care of kicking their butt? Me. She's very good with them. She's, um, she'll play with them. She protects them, you know. Then she'll get mad like any other, you know, adult, brother and sister. Uh, she's real good with them. She, She's by his best friend. She really is. Sean needs that protection and a lot of encouragement. Let's play ball. Sean, can you make a basket? Heather! Okay, make a basket. My... No! Nope, didn't make it. Did you see what she did? She went like this. <laughs> <laughs> make a basket, Sean. Oh, oh ball. almost made it. Boop. Try on here, Sean. Come on. Here. Sean scores! Dr. Virginia Nelson sees Sean and his family regularly. Dr. Nelson works extensively with children and young adults who have cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy is a disorder of movement that results from a brain injury. This is something that happens either before or around the time of birth or in the very early infancy that causes some part of the body or parts of the body not to move the way they normally would. It there may be associated disorders that go along with it, such as seizures or hearing problems or vision problems, but the term itself applies to the movement disorder, and it's non-progressive. It doesn't get worse. It's because something has happened to the brain. Often, when parents first learn their baby has a disability, their grief distances them from their child. Dr. Nelson. They go through the stages of mourning just as if they had lost a child just as if they had lost an arm themselves. And that's natural, because it is the death of the dream of the normal child. Your baby's supposed to be perfect. That's the way babies are supposed to be. They're perfect, and he wasn't. And uh, so I was really kind of like, you know, I didn't want to hold him and things. And then later on, I kind of blamed myself. It's like my fault that he's going through all this. Like, like, what did I do wrong? Yeah, I, it was my fault. I must not have uh, eaten right or something. And, and then I rejected him. And, you know, mothers don't reject their children, so how dare you? And this is your way of being punished. Grief and guilt made it difficult for Juana to form an attachment with her baby, an attachment that would enable him to get off to a good developmental start in life, one that would create what psychoanalyst Eric Erickson called a sense of basic trust. But eventually she did form a bond, and Sean took advantage of the remarkable resilience that's part of human nature. He got off to a good start, even if it was a little late. 
After the establishment of trust, said Erickson, a child needs to develop senses of autonomy, initiative, and industry, and in that order. But Sean came to these issues later than other kids, and now he faces them all at once. We're trying to potty train him right now, and he was real excited because we were at Hardy's one day, and this was about a month ago, and he said he had to go to the bathroom with us. Here we go again, you know. But I took him, and he did. And every time we go by that Hardee's, I went to potty in that Hardee's, you know, and he had to tell everybody, anybody that listened to him, you know, he was going to tell him. He's just real excited about any little accomplishment. He's very excited about it, and we make a big deal of it. We're very excited about it. Developing a sense of autonomy is hard for the physically disabled child. Harder still are the tasks of initiative and industry, coming to believe that you can do things and do them well. Sean is just beginning to realize how difficult it will be to feel confident and competent. What well, was last week? He says, Mom, I don't like this hand because he doesn't use his right hand very much. I said, what's wrong? He said, it's broke. I don't like it. It's bad, you know. And I said, no, it's not bad, you know. It's, it'll work. You just have to think about it, you know. Like almost every kid his age, Sean wants to learn. He wants to be an industrious child. Fortunately, his sister Heather wants to teach him. You like to help him learn things? Yeah. What? Like today when we were looking at that basketball book, I showed him who people were when he didn't know sometimes. I like when we go upstairs to my room, we start playing. I teach him, I, play, I ask him if he wants to read a book or play school or something. I like teaching him a lot sometimes. What do you hope he can learn in the next couple of years? To walk. Yeah. How can you help him? Well, I keep holding him up a lot of times and let him walk to place to place and why I'm holding on to him. So I, my mom says he's usually learning from me things. And Sean's attending a special school for disabled children. He loves what he's doing, learning things according to his timetable and no one else's. He's learning colors and his numbers. He can spell his name but reading. They're teaching them, you know, starting to get them ready and things like that, but he's a long ways away from that, yeah. Sean can't keep up with other kids, but his family doesn't mind. They're proud of what he accomplishes when it's time for him. Come on, Sean, you can do it, you know. And whenever he does anything, we sit there and clap and root him on, and, and he gets a smile from ear to ear, and she does, you know, she's real proud of him. You know, if he comes home and he says, Heather, I drew this picture today, or I did this, you know. And, She's right there to listen to every word he had to say. Dr. Nelson. That is clearly a need for, for any child or adolescent as they grow up. They have to have self-confidence, self-esteem, or they're not going to make that next step. If something is harder and you take two steps forward and one step back, whenever you try something, you don't have as positive a feeling as if you take two steps forward and then another two steps forward. And so it's harder, and you have to have a bigger ego and feel better about yourself and, and, uh, and be willing to accept those setbacks and be willing to develop a sense of humor and laugh when you fall flat or you can't do this uh, and have that stick to itiveness and just be willing to try again. That's hard. For disabled children, the timing of developmental tasks is different and that makes things harder in childhood. But the real difficulty and the real challenge lies ahead in the years of early adolescence. Probably the hardest age for the child is that, that early adolescence, 9 to 13 age group. Uh, they want to be like everybody else. And even something as simple as a different hair color, different eye color, wearing glasses, uh, wearing braces before it's the popular thing to do in junior high, uh, is difficult because they are different. They can't do the same things. They don't look the same. Uh, they can't keep up with their friends. It's a hard age. Jenny Hamburg remembers the difficult years that Dr. Nelson's talking about. Jenny's now 19. She, too, has cerebral palsy. Well, I had long hair, and then I had it cut short, and then I had it curled. 
but I never really, I never really looked pretty, and I always wanted to look, you know, I always wondered what it would be like if I looked like Brooke Shields, but I was in a wheelchair. Would I have dates or not? That was, that was what I always wondered, you know. When Jenny was a child, she didn't wonder about acceptance. Her mother, Frances, knew what Jenny was capable of, so she fought to keep her in the educational mainstream. I just went to the principal of the school and said, uh, I have Jenny here and I would like to have her in the regular kindergarten. And he said something about the kindergarten being terribly crowded. And I said, well, if I had moved here with triplets just before school opened, you'd have found room in that kindergarten. So <laughs> they took her in the kindergarten and then after that there just never was an argument and it went very smoothly. I had friends and I'd usually be included in recess activities. and. And also I had the advantage that all the kids knew I was one of the smart kids. You know, they might think the kid in the wheelchair, but they didn't think the dumb kid in the wheelchair because I always got the A's. I mean, my friends figured out how I could play Chinese jump rope and regular jump rope, and I had a friend who um, used to sort of skateboard on the back of my chair here. And we'd go up and down the halls like that, and it drove the teachers crazy. <laughs> but, you know, I had fun in elementary school. But things changed in junior high and high school. Frances recalls one incident. Her coming home from high school saying, I'm just invisible. In other words, the other kids would all stand around and talk about how they were going to do something after the football game on Saturday night or Friday night. And they would just assume that she would not be interested. I mean, there were like school dances once a month and I never went to those. I mean, it takes a lot of guts even when you're 18 or something to go to a dance and just see who's there. But when you're 14, there's no way. She would keep fixing on something that if only she could have, everything would be fine. And contact lenses came up. If only I had contact lenses, then my social life would be all different. So we went round and round about this, about, oh, well, you don't realize if I had contact lenses, everything would be lovely. And finally, I found myself just screaming at her, saying, Jenny, don't you think there's something else people notice about you? And then, of course, I could shoot myself. <laughs> you know, I didn't go out. I didn't do anything, and I hated it. And so basically I went from being what I thought was a perfectly normal student and doing everything with everybody to suddenly, you know, being completely out in left field somewhere. Left field isn't the easiest place to deal with another set of feelings that arise in early adolescence. Dr. Nelson. As a child uh, begins to notice the opposite sex and to have thoughts about their own sexuality, one of their first questions is, you know, I, I can't walk or I can't do this, can I function sexually? And most parents or sex education programs don't provide that sort of information to children that, yes, you can or no, you can't, depending on what their physical disability is, and here are your options. So that here's how you can function or can't function. There are choices that many disabled youngsters have to make, hard choices about sexuality and even harder about walking. Jenny turned to Dr. Nelson. And she was the first one who basically said, well, you can choose whether you want to walk or whether you have other activities that, because you can spend hours and hours and learn to walk and be able to walk around on crutches. Or you can just decide that you don't want to walk and do everything else. And she was the first one who ever admitted that there was sort of a choice there. I like to, to lay things out to families and to kids if they're old enough and to understand, of there's no black and white in working with handicapped kids. It's rare that they have to do something or their lives are going to be injured if they don't. And so parents and subsequently their kids have to make decisions about what's important to them. At some point, they have to look at academics versus therapy because there's not enough time in the day to have academics, to have a social life, and to do therapy and to do homework and anything else they might want to do. And so they have to prioritize what's most important. To be able to walk, Jenny would have to do hours of exercises every day. She'd already had three surgeries with walking in mind. In the end, she decided that academics and a social life were more important than walking. 
She put her time into studies and got good grades. She became an attractive young woman with an impish sense of humor. But no one called and asked her for a date, ever. Prom nights were especially hard. I never got to go. I always wanted to go, but I didn't get to go. And I'd always, you know, I'd go with my friends, we'd go to the mall and I'd pick out what they were going to wear. <laughs> but, you know, I wasn't shy, but nobody ever invited me. Jenny graduated from high school and decided she wanted to go to college, away from home, on her own. She would build her life on persistence and ability in the classroom. That fall, her mother drove her to school. To launch her down here and have her roll off across the Diag one day, heading for orientation or wherever, I can't even remember what, and driving off, it was a frightening point. But when I realized that she was making it, that was really one of the high points, because up to that point, I really wasn't sure that she'd be able to live by herself. Jenny is now a junior in college, specializing in languages. She has continued to do well academically. Socially, things have gotten better, bit by bit. I had a German exam in freshman year that was four hours long, so they decided to have a party after that. And everybody went upstairs to this party, and then my friend came down from it the next day, and she's like, wow, all the guys up there were talking about what a cool person you are and how great you are. And I said, well, if I'm such a great person, why didn't you come down and carry me upstairs? And she's sort of, well, we kind of never thought that far. And it's that kind of thing. And that still goes on now. I mean, every year it gets a little better, but it's just by very, very small smidgens. Perhaps the most important developmental task of late adolescence is discovering who you are and what you want to be, forming what Eric Erickson called an identity. For the disabled, who often know more certainly who they're not than who they are, it can take a long time. And yet Jenny has a fierce honesty about herself. I'd like to be the sort of person, well, I have one friend who had this sort of idea that, you know, I was just perfect and I bounce into life and I cheerfully go along and I figure out my problems, basically the way I've, uh, the way I've been talking to you now. And I'd like to be that kind of a person. You know, I really would. I strive to, <laughs> strive to um, be perfect. And it really came as quite a blow to him that, um, that I'm not perfect, and I cry a lot, and I hit walls, and, you know, I'll yell at people when it isn't their fault, and things like that. To form an identity, it helps to have role models, people you admire and want to be like. But for the disabled, such models are hard to find. Dr. Nelson. There are very few good role models with physical disabilities. Uh, a normal kid sees role models in their teachers, their parents, other people that they meet in their everyday lives. But how many people are there who are, use crutches or wheelchairs who are teachers, who are parents, who are physicians, who are ministers, whatever it is that provide the role models to the kids? And so they don't have that role model to say, I made it, and here were the problems I had growing up, but look at me now, I'm a successful adult and these are the things I do to fulfill my life. Part of identity is knowing what you want to be, and Jenny looks forward to a career, maybe in the Foreign Service, maybe as a librarian or teacher. But for her, the first question is not, what can I do, but rather, where can I live? You can't just think, this is a neat career, and I'll do it. I'm not one of those kids who can major in creative writing and wait on tables. I have to always think in terms of, well, in terms of where I'm going to live, does the city have a good bus system or not? Because Dr. Nelson has always been big on me learning to drive, and I started to learn to drive, but I really scared myself. So I'd really prefer not to. The joke I always have with my friends is, well, I'll, I'll, I'll learn to drive if I get married and I have to haul my kids back and forth in the suburbs of Connecticut, but not before. And whether it's Connecticut, California, or any place in between, Jenny would like to be a mom. 
I'd like to have a family. Three kids, a cat, a dog, a garden. <laughs> I mean, I could go on. <laughs> but, you know, I just, it's really strange because lots of people have dreams of glamour, fame, or fortune. What I want, basically, is what everybody else considers, considers a normal life. And, you know, I have friends who worry about what kind of job they're going to get but just, you know, take it for granted that they'll be able to get married and have little kids and have their dog, their cat, and everything else like that. And for me, that's one of the things that I'm not sure whether I'll ever have that opportunity. Young people with disabilities face the same developmental tasks as everyone else, only at different times. Life is hard, but often society makes it harder. A person has a physical disability their handicap is what's imposed on them by society, whether it's stairs that prevent the wheelchair from getting into a building, or attitudes that say, you can't go to college because you use a wheelchair, or you don't have a brain because you're sitting in a chair and I'm going to talk over you, or you don't talk right, therefore you can't have a job, or whatever it is. And I think the, the social uh, handicaps are more disabling than the physical disabilities in many cases. Every one of us has experienced the difference between a disability and a handicap, between our own limitations and those imposed by society. What we may not realize is that the same disability that limits growth in one area may encourage it in another. For some of us, a physical disability dramatically alters the course of development, making it slower, making it harder, changing its sequence. Still, no matter what our timetable and no matter what our path, we all experience the same seasons of life. Like Sean Miller and Jenny Hamburg, we all want the same things out of life. Kids like me want to do absolutely everything else that everybody does. They want to do well in school. They want to have dates. They want to go to parties. They, they want to misbehave and everything. 